When we finally tally the history of the so-called war on drugs, the remarks made Monday by Attorney General Eric Holder could well be remembered as being a tipping point, all because of two words, too many. Too many Americans go to too many prisons for far too long and for no truly good law enforcement reason. Even though this country comprises just 5% of the world's population, we incarcerate almost a quarter of the world's prisoners. Almost 800%. That's how much the federal prison population has grown since 1980. Nearly 7 million. That's how many people in the United States were under some kind of adult correctional supervision at the end of 2011. That's one in 34 adults. More than 2.2 million are incarcerated in local, state, and federal prisons. And of that number, 1.57 million inmates are just in state and federal prisons. And of that number, just 219,000 inmates are in federal prisons. But that's still nearly 40% over capacity. And the ratio of inmates to staff is as much as 5 to 1. Why are so many in federal prison? The strict mandatory minimum drug sentencing guidelines Holder referred to in his speech are a big reason why. In 2010 alone, more than 70 percent of federal convictions carrying a mandatory minimum sentence were for drug trafficking crimes. That's nearly 8 in 10. If you happen to get caught with 100 kilograms of marijuana, that's about 220 pounds, federal mandatory minimums require a five-year sentence. But just 500 grams of cocaine gets you the same five-year bid. And a mere 28 grams of crack cocaine gets you the same sentence. Attorney General Eric Holder is now proposing to take those numbers out of the equation, to take the amount of illegal drugs out of any, of any kind out of sentencing procedures for nonviolent federal drug offenders. What all that means for future offenders and those already in the system, next. Jesse Jackson Jr. is going to prison. So is his wife, but not at the same time. A U.S. District Judge on Wednesday sentenced the former Democratic congressman from Illinois to 30 months in prison for misuse of campaign funds. Jackson's wife, Sandy, was also sentenced to one year in prison for failing for years to report the campaign money spent on personal luxuries as income. The couple will serve their sentences one after the other so there is at least one parent at home for their two children. Now, this isn't uncommon or preferential treatment. More to the point, it's the humane, better thing to do. Attorney General Eric Holder took a big step towards better on Monday when it comes to low-level drug crimes by proposing serious sentencing reform, something that pretty much everyone is in favor of, even ALEC. Yes, the American Legislative Exchange Council, the driving force behind so much extreme right-wing legislation in state and national politics, backed a congressional bill earlier this month that would give judges discretion to reduce statutory minimum sentences. So if even ALEC, which once backed tougher sentencing laws, is for making our justice system more sensible, who could be against it? Believe it or not, we can think of a few. So back to our panel again, we do have Seema and Sunita still with us. There are people who oppose this idea of mandatory, of changing mandatory minimum sentences. Well, you're talking about Paul Gosser, right, who was all up in Eric Holder's face after Fast and Furious went down. So he has his own political agenda and motivation. But generally, it seems that conservatives are pretty happy about it because of the ridiculous amounts of money we'll be saving. Right. But what about prosecutors? I mean, in your job, does the idea of discretion change the way you do your job? When you're charging someone with a crime, do you have in the back of your mind, you know what, this is a low-level level drug dealer, but if I charge him with X, the mandatory minimum kicks in. Do you, does that change the way you actually do your job? Yes, because now at some, on some level, the prosecutors have more discretion because the amount of drugs won't be in the charging instrument, okay? So at that point, the prosecutor is left to consider other factors like mitigation in terms of is there community service, is there a program, but the prosecutor also has to look at was this person a manager or a supervisor in a conspiracy in a drug organization is there any violence alleged was a weapon involved so both the judge and the prosecutor in this case get to open their eyes to who the defendant really is as opposed to just an amount of drugs but, so, so that doesn't always work that way obviously we've been right. covering a lot on, on this show the case of Clarence Aaron and this was the young man who was he's seeking clemency since 1993 he got three life sentences for mere 
merely introducing a college friend whose roommate or a college friend um, who had a relative that was in the drug trade to another person in the drug trade. That transaction happened. He got three life sentences. He actually got the longest sentence of the three people. I mean, in, in, in our mandatory minimums at all doing what Seema said, where they're allowing the prosecutor and the judge to think about it before they charge and before they proceed. No, I mean, this is a tragic case of a young man who's now in his 40s, and it, it, it's just outrageous that in this country we would allow something like this to happen. Mandatory minimums don't make anyone safer. They just cause a prison glut, and it's a waste of taxpayer resources. I think Seema's right that many conservatives and people on, on, the, on the right who we would think would be against this kind of change are actually a little bit muted in, the, in their response, um, which is great. And I think that what we're seeing around the country it's not just on the federal level, but even within the states. Certain states are starting to uh, do away with mandatory minimums and three strikes your outlaws, which is which is a great improvement and will um, not only improve the use of taxpayer resources, but will go a long way towards uh, diminishing the warehousing of black and brown people in this country. And that's interesting because if you notice, while the federal prisons are expanding, they're operating under 40 percent above capacity now the state jail and prison system has been reduced so it seems that the feds are looking at the states and saying maybe that's how we should run our system now more alternative to incarceration programs more probation because let me tell you something joy my goal as a criminal defense attorney is keep the client out of prison. Going to prison changes your life. It changes everything. There is no coming back. If a client goes to jail and it does, whether it's a few months or even a year or even a little more, they have more chance to rehabilitate themselves. All right. Well, thank you very much to Seema Iyer uh, and Sunita Patel. Thank you both. And coming up.